thank you all for uh, a really stimulating two days worth of presentations and discussion. We're really grateful for the NBSTRN for pulling this together and for all the hard work that the de dedicated um, ACMG team has put into uh, these past two days worth of um, stimulating presentations. I think that what we would like to do is continue the conversation that we hope to stimulate at the end of yesterday's session when we posed several questions for you all. And I know some of you were able to answer the questions at the close of the Zoom meeting yesterday, but we'd like to open this up at, in a very informal way to general feedback and comments from anyone who is participating in terms of really providing some helpful information about the future of newborn screening research in particular, and ways in which you think that we at NICHD and our other federal partners can help support you in your efforts to help advance that mission. And I'm wondering if I could ask the uh, NBSTR, NBSTRN team to just pull up those um, slides from yesterday's presentation where we have the questions listed and use that as a starting point. Amy, I see that you put a link in the chat. Is What is that to? The link in the chat is to your symposium this October. Oh, OK, great. Thank you. The, NB, the yep, NICHD. Yes. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yep. Which slide? Let's see. Uh, I think it's slide, I want to say 19, 18 or 19. There were two slides, um, one of which, um, just to remind people who may not have had an opportunity to uh, participate yesterday or stay for the, uh, the final presentation. And some of these questions have been raised by several of the speakers throughout the past two days. So it's certainly not anything unique to us at NICHD. Um, but some of the emerging questions, I just wanted to reiter reiterate quickly, and then we'll um, turn to the questions. So one of the emerging issues is the ability to screen for a group of disorders rather than adding a single condition by a single condition, recognizing that that puts a significant strain on many of the laboratories in the state programs with regard to being able to accommodate all of those advances um, and the increasing number of conditions that are either eligible or nominated for inclusion on the RUSP. So emerging issues one and two are closely linked to each other. And then uh, the third bullet is really, um, should we think about newborn screening as a paradigm to help alleviate the diagnostic odyssey even if specific treatments are not yet available, but we anticipate they might be available in the near future. This is not something we're gonna to adopt tomorrow, certainly, but I think it's an issue that a lot of groups have been struggling with and have really wanted to embrace just because the knowledge that can be gained from being able to identify a condition in the neonatal period can inform quality of life and decision-making for families and that child. The fourth issue or bullet is one really related to diversity. And when we think about diversity and increasing the diversity with regard to newborn screening, um, we think about it in several different contexts. One is increasing the representation of communities that have traditionally been underrepresented, particularly for some of the new technologies and some of the emerging genome-based therapies that may not be equitably available for all communities. And then a second related diversity issue is increasing the diversity of investigators and trainees who are involved in newborn screening. And thirdly, making sure that all families have access to newborn screen related uh, interventions. And then finally, anything that we do that could be paradigm shifting or novel or innovative runs the risk of um, disrupting the newborn screening enterprise. And we certainly don't want to damage the trust that families and communities have in newborn screening programs. So anything that we think about doing in the future really needs to always incorporate that lens of thinking about the ramifications for anything that is, that is new and, and groundbreaking. So those are some initial ideas and issues and we welcome any feedback from anyone who may have wanna to speak to those or may have additional 
issues that they want to raise. And then if you want to go to the next slide, we'll just leave the next slide up, which basically has some of the questions that we really want your feedback on. What does the future of newborn screening research look like? What should our priorities be in the future? How can we incorporate new technologies and new therapies into newborn screening? And how can our institute and the NIH better support newborn screening researchers? And you're welcome to put any comments or feedback into the chat or raise your hand and speak them, speak any comments out loud. Let's go ahead. Are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, I think so. I uh, appreciate it there. Um, and so one of the things, and while this slide is up, uh, we at uh, Metabolon are definitely passionate about uh, newborn screening. Uh, and one of the things that's very interesting is that we've talked a lot about the incorporation of whole genome sequencing and some of the huge beneficial impact on incorporating that or the potential incorporation of that into newborn screening. But then there are also other omic methods, uh, proteomics and metabolomics, which is what Metabolon specializes in analysis of the metabolic pathways of a patient in disease, and really being able to incorporate multiple omic technologies to help identify a patient's variations from their genetic code, variations in their biological pathway, and how that those different technologies working together can really help identify where a patient has some genetic variations, where they have metabolic variations, and where they have variations within their biological pathways that may be used to either understand how they may experience the disease or potentially provide information on understanding their severity uh, of the disease, as well as even potentially providing information on how to treat them or guide developments of treatments for these patients. Well, I'll start off and make a comment, and then if, if other folks want to weigh in as well, you know, I think you raise a, a really important uh, comment and consideration, and one that at NIH we are certainly engaged in. I think the multi-omics approach is one that um, has been embraced by a number of different research programs. Certainly, it's not mainstream at this point in most aspects of clinical care. Um, nor in newborn screening. But you know, since many of the conditions that we are currently identifying really do have um, a metabolic component, then being able to look at the metabolome, in some cases the proteome, uh, the transcriptome, and, and other omics evaluations really, I think, can enhance the ability to not only diagnose, but understand prognosis for many of these conditions. And you know, currently, we do have a number of research programs across NIH um, that are trying to take that multi-omics approach to a given either patient population or a given group of individuals. Because um, at this point, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the data challenges are, are, are formidable, but not uh, insurmountable. And a lot of um, pathways and a lot of um, data flows are really developing to help us understand the role of all of these different uh, forms of, of data in, in terms of what the disease entity is. We have an initiative that we've launched relatively recently, <clears throat> just looking at people with Down syndrome and trying to take a multi-omics approach to figuring out what are the co-occurring conditions that are most likely to occur for some of those individuals. And it's really informative, even though everybody with Down syndrome essentially has an extra copy of chromosome 21, the other genetic and environmental and omic contributors to the manifestations of Down syndrome in a given individual are quite variable. And so this approach that you suggest is one that I think has a lot of promise. And if you have some specific examples of ways in which you think um, that can be effective in the newborn screening space, you know, please speak up. I see we have another person who raised a hand. Is that related to this topic as well, uh, Matthew Ellenwood? Not exactly, but a, a but a question for you, uh, if you will, would mind taking it. I was interested to know what is the mechanism uh, for deciding what syndromes are going to be put out for an IDIQ uh, um, from NI uh, from your institute, 
Uh, I noticed that the timelines were such that there were programs that were actively being screened in by other states. And then you also had a contract and it seems like there were missed opportunities to help advance new nominations from that process. So just curious how that selection process works. That's a really great question. And one that I could probably spend a half an hour waxing uh, eloquent about, but essentially there are a number of factors that go into the decision-making process for the choice of a particular condition for an IDIQ contract. One of the challenges is that um, particularly with some of the um, some of the legislation that that has hampered newborn screening research through the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act did not allow for um, research to be done in the context of many state screening laboratories. So for a number of years, and if you looked at the timeline that we presented yesterday, we were sort of playing catch up in that the conditions that we were um, competing for the IDIQs were essentially ones that had either been adopted, most of them had just been adopted for or selected for addition to the recommended uniform screening panel. So that meant that what we're trying to do is build part of the evidence base that will inform um, states that are interested in adopting a new condition. And in those situations, we know that those IDIQ um, contracts were not necessarily um, creating the evidence base for a new nomination, but essentially we're helping to uh, provide real world data to help laboratories in adopting one of these new, new um, conditions that have been added to the RUSP. What we're trying to do is move our timeline even earlier so that we are choosing conditions that either are highly likely to be nominated for the RUSP or have just been nominated so that some of the data can help inform RUSP nomination processes. It's a little bit of a, of a tricky moving target because um, we don't always know what's gonna be coming down the pike in terms of a nomination. And the timeline from the, from the point of nomination to actual review by the advisory committee is fairly tightly regulated. So that creates some challenges for us in getting an IDIQ contract awarded and the data gathered in time for the nomination to for, to for it to benefit the nomination process. However, that is a place where we'd like to be. The other considerations though include that uh, the condition cannot be so rare that if we screen for 100,000 babies, we're not likely to find a single case. So that criterion also weighs in. And we utilize many of our resources, including the NBS TRN and its pilot studies work group to help us in identifying what conditions are the ones that are most prime for consideration for the IDIQ. But I appreciate your comments and questions and certainly welcome any other thoughts about that. Thank you. That's a very, uh, a lot of clarification there. I appreciate your time. Molly, do you have anything you want to add? I think, you know, if folks have ideas for conditions that would make good candidates for uh, being a future pilot condition, please send them to Melissa and I. We're very interested in hearing ideas from the community about this. So. Don't be shy, I'll drop our emails in the, the chat box. And I'll just add to that the MBSCR, the conditions resources where we keep track of candidates potentially for IDIQs or for pilots. So if you look at that list, you can sort it by the candidates. And if we're missing something that you think it should be a candidate, we can definitely add that to the list and make sure that we create awareness around it. It's really from advocacy groups like yours, Matthew, and researchers and clinicians that we get, you know, can add conditions to this list. So thank you. It's kind of all hands on deck process. I don't think there's a simple, straightforward way to say, you know, here's the obvious next condition that we should pilot through the IDIQ process. So we do appreciate your feedback. I think, um, Prem, do you have your hand raised? Uh, yes. Uh uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Prem Shikhavat uh, uh, from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm a neonatologist and an endocrinologist. So uh, I want to make a comment and uh, bring up a, a issue that has been uh, bothering me for a number of years now. Uh, newborn screening has served the term neonate very well. We have been able to you know, uh, make early diagnosis for a number of metabolic disorders, treat them earlier, and uh, prevent any 
long-term, uh, you know, uh, neurodevelopmental adverse impact on uh, many of these neonates. Where the, the place where it, it has failed, I feel, is the preterm neonate. Uh, the rate of prematurity varies from eight to 10% in the United States. And especially the extremely low birth weight babies uh, are clearly uh, are the problem. So what we end up doing in the NICU is repeating newborn screening like three, four, five, six times till they are normal. And uh, there are many of metabolic disorders. Uh, to give you an example, like adrenal. So adrenal, you know, 17 OHP is used as a common marker for adrenal insufficiency. And uh, we have different criteria for uh, a preterm, extremely low birth weight babies. Uh, but there's a condition called relative adrenal insufficiency in these babies, which lasts from say 22 weeks till 34 weeks. And uh, the treatment for that condition is highly variable. The condition is not even defined properly. There's a need for research. There's a need for supplementation of cortisol to these babies in an appropriate amount of time. And if we don't do that, it leads to a lot of morbidity. And uh, uh, we set them up for problems for the for the for the lifetime. So do you think uh, we should focus on these babies and have some more research funding for uh, defining conditions like relative adrenal insufficiency because their enzymes are immature, they are not working yet, they need some supplementation, but not for life, but only for a short period of time. And same thing applies for hypothyroidism. They have what is called youth thyroid six syndrome, and uh, uh, there's a need to do research whether that condition needs to be treated or not. If not, uh, why? And if yes, then you know up to what extent. Especially, I'm uh, seeing that uh, uh, there's a misuse of uh, uh, postnatal steroids to the extent that it is causing uh, brain damage. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of ba babies who are exposed to high dose, you no know, fluorinated uh, steroids, which leads to you know, neurodevelopmental problems. And uh, 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 some attention needs to be paid to that area, which is uh, has not been the focus of uh, the newborn screening yet. So I want to know what people think about these issues, whether uh, we should include them and focus on them and their problems. Well, I'll take a stab at it and, and open it up to anyone else on the panel as well. Um, so you raise a, a very interesting and important um, issue. And it sounds to me from your experience that sometimes these premature infants are dismissed as having immaturity. And so they're not appropriately treated, even though they have at least a temporary um, hypothyroidism or hypocortisol or adrenal insufficiency, such that they would require treatment um, to optimize their outcomes long term. But we dismiss them because their newborn screening results are abnormal, but we say, oh, that's because they're premature. Is, is that the one of the issues, Dr. Yes, Shekhar correct. Okay. Yes, correct. You know, and, and thank you for raising this as a question. I mean, I would really encourage you and, and or your colleagues to um, put together a proposal. I mean, this sounds like something that's really worthy of research that could benefit from some focused attention and research funding. So I would I would be happy, myself or Dr. Muneer would be happy to talk with you if you wanted to put some sort of a, a proposal together, try to identify where the issues are and what kinds of studies could be done to help define this entity better. Because I think we all recognize that there are unique challenges for screening in, in um, preterm infants. And in fact, some of the algorithms that are used to determine cutoffs for various metabolites really try to incorporate prematurity into those algorithms. I think that's that's really important. And my hope is that gestational age will become a required element as the Eden Project continues so that we can try to make sure that um, those considerations are taken into account when identifying babies with a variety of different conditions. Yeah, I think I will be in touch with the, uh, the panel. Great, thank you. Thanks. Mike, who? I see you raising your hand. Yes, hi, uh, Dr. Parisi, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm a parent uh, with kids with, uh, affected by genetic disease that can be screened. Uh, and I'm now also a newborn screening researcher. 
My question to both you and Dr. Minir is uh, at a high level, uh, in terms of what NSCHD in its power can do, do you have any thoughts on how we can encourage um, you know, breakthrough uh, treatment developers to also put newborn screening into their thinking uh, you know, from the get-go? I think we all know treatments are one of the requirements for newborn screening uh, to be uh, nominated and initiated for any condition. Uh, and fortunately, the trend is that many developers are putting that into their minds from the beginning. Uh, however, there are still many that are lagging behind where the treatment is already far ahead, uh, but the newborn screening wasn't even put into thought. And I think those are opportunities missed for advancing newborn screening at the same time and maximizing the efficiency of our research and um, uh, of the efforts. Uh, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that front. And Mike, are you referring specifically to drug development efforts in, in particular, and the fact that oftentimes when new medications are developed, they start with the oldest, quote unquote, safest age range for testing, and then only with subsequent rounds of FDA review and approval are some of those treatments then um, basically approved for use in newborns. Is that, is that is one definitely of the one of the most prominent issues I see. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think we as a field need to turn our thinking all around, uh, especially for the developers, because while the population who are clearly affected are easiest to identify and then um, uh, move into trials, uh, for most of the diseases, the treatment window really is before the symptoms emerge. So I think before, if the, if the developers are not thinking about newborn screening at all in their design, it will be a golden opportunity missed. And, and, and I just hope we can have some way of uh, moving them into thinking about it at least. Well, I have a couple of thoughts on that, and then I'll, I'll let Dr. Manier and others make comments as well. So first of all, you're absolutely right that sometimes the, the optimal treatment window really is in the newborn period, and sometimes even prior to the newborn period. But let's let's focus on newborns for now, since that's the, the topic of this workshop. And essentially, I think that um, the two strategies that I've seen that I think are making inroads in this particular dilemma one of them is just a recognition of the value, particularly of gene targeted therapies in the newborn period. And so I mentioned a workshop that was hosted by NIH that I think you were involved in about a year ago, where we had gene targeted therapies, early diagnosis and equitable delivery. And really I think to me, and I hope to most of the participants in that workshop, and I encourage you to check out some of the recordings from many of the presentations, which were just outstanding, that if we recognize that the newborn period does provide this window of opportunity to intervene when you have the potential to have the greatest impact and the, the lowest amount of long-term, lifelong morbidity, then that should really be an area of focus. And, and I think a lot of folks are really, um, are really starting to embrace that paradigm and that way of thinking. Um, obviously, I can't get on my soapbox and convince all the, the drug developers and, and therapeutics developers that that's the way to go. But I do think having FDA involved in some of those workshops and discussions and developing some mechanisms for really encouraging um, treatments with a lens towards intervening as, as early as possible, including in the newborn period, I think, I think we're starting to see some movement in that. And one other area that I wanted to mention where I think we've had some positive um, movement is with regard to the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, or BGTC. And you may be, are you familiar with this, uh, Mike? So this is really um, um, the foundation for NIH is coordinating. It's a public-private partnership involving a number of NIH institutes, as well as quite a few pharmaceutical industry representatives. And they're trying to develop platforms that will allow for uh, more standardization of gene therapy approaches so that you can develop a vector or a cassette that can be utilized for just more than one mutation or, 
or clinically significant variant in one gene, and you can really allow for larger scale adoption of some of these therapeutic approaches. And I think many of us recognize, at least for genetic diseases, that gene targeted therapies are really one of the potential waves of the future that could intervene early enough to make a big difference. So some of those activities are ongoing. This project is really still in its infancy, but I think the first group of conditions that are going to be targeted for the BGTC um, approach has been selected. And in fact, I would encourage people to go to the website. Maybe someone can post the website um, in the chat. Um, currently so that you, you all can look at what's going on in that space. But some of those conditions are certainly ones with pediatric onset. And my hope is that we'll continue to push the needle earlier, earlier, because the earlier we can intervene for many of these conditions that have a more degenerative course, the better the outcomes for those for those impacted children and their families. Thank you. Any other, does anyone else have something they want to add to this? Because I think that's a really important consideration. And maybe some of you all know of some other examples. I have some things, thoughts I'd like to offer. I see two ways out of the conundrum that we have for rare uh, pediatric onset neurodegenerative diseases. One is the adoption of primary uh, biologically relevant biomarkers that allow us to approve therapies regardless of what uh, certain aspects of clinical response will show. San Filippo syndrome, for example, in our space, we've had three failed trials because by the time the kids get diagnosed, they're not going to respond. They're, they're, uh, they've passed a therapeutic threshold of response to the neurodegenerative disease. We know that the vectors work or the enzymes work but they're not going to respond because we can't get them treated early enough. And we can't get them early enough because we can't get newborn screening because we don't have a therapy. It's a classic chicken and egg dilemma. I would the other, the other solution is if FDA can't see their way to that approach is for us to think about uh, through the NIH, hopefully, paired submissions of milestone driven grants, including uh, a simultaneous project involving newborn screening and an innovative gene therapy through a clinician invest investigated project, something like that, so that we could see an integrated application that addresses these two issues. I know you guys have programs that will do newborn screening technology and therapies, but something that's paired so we'll get the patients and then we have stuff on board to treat them. That would be my approach. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Those are both really insightful. And, and can I take it um, that you would potentially advocate for diagnosis even in the absence of a given therapy, particularly for some conditions such as um, San Filippo that you mentioned, where by the time the diagnosis is made, it's too late to intervene. And knowledge of the condition, at least knowledge of genetic variants that would predispose to the condition would allow for you know, recruitment of individuals into some of those studies. And, and I appreciate your comment about having some sort of a, a paired diagnostic and therapeutic um, strategy. You know, I, I, there, there were certainly ethical challenges with um, considering that type of approach, um, but I certainly would never close the door. And I think there could be some possibilities depending on um, say an initial pilot condition that might actually um, prove to be effective uh, in terms of that particular strategy. So thank you for that for that comment and those ideas. Got a thumbs up there. Thank you. Uh, so, Melissa and Molly, you talked a little bit about the new data sharing uh, policies and procedures that are going to be coming in NICHD or across NIH. Um, any, any ideas about how that might overlay with these four key questions or things that you want us all to think about? I think from my perspective, um, what we're really hoping from the NIH is that this new policy is going to enable 
faster and broader sharing of data. And that by requiring researchers to kind of think ahead of time about the data they're collecting, how they're going to preserve it, and how they'll share it, that we won't see quite as much of a delay between the time when we fund the project and when we eventually get the data deposited into something like dbgab or one of our other NIH repositories. Um, so my hope is that it will facilitate better and easier data sharing, although I know certainly in the newborn screening space, this is always a challenge because of state level regulations and you know other barriers that can prohibit some of that broad data sharing, plus the fact that you're working with rare diseases. And so the number of patients is also very small, leading to potential re-identification risks. Um, but certainly we want to encourage researchers to share their data as broadly as allowed. Um, and if there are things that we can be doing at NIH to help make this a little bit easier, because I know the process can be quite daunting, um, especially if you've never worked with something like dbGaP, it is a complicated beast and it takes the steep learning curve to get familiar with it, in both in terms of depositing data and requesting data. Um, so feel free to reach out to us with questions on how to do any of that data access, but also if you have ideas for how we can make the process easier. And one of the things I'll note, the, the new policy also allows you to request funds for activities related to data management and sharing. So you can actually budget for time and staff effort to actually QC your data and, and deposit it into these databases. And just a comment on that, you know, all of the research that we support at NIH is funded by the American public. You as taxpayers are funding the research that we hope is going to result in advances for all of these conditions and really benefit quality of life for families impacted by newborn screening related disorders. So, you know, it really behooves all of us to make sure that those data that are being generated by public funds are made publicly available. And we're already seeing through a number of initiatives across NIH that have sort of been at the vanguard of data sharing efforts that this is this is really yielding incredible um, productive and new avenues of research. And the thing is that it, when data are sort of hoarded or just kept within a given investigator's own um, uh, servers or at their own institution, the, the ways in which it can be used, you can't even begin to think of all the different applications that some of these data sets can provide. And so um, from our perspective, we see that there are so many benefits to, to broad data sharing and very few downsides. There are some for sure, and there are certainly barriers and challenges to doing it. We're not saying it's easy, but the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages. And so we're putting our money where our mouth is and really requiring this across the board for all newborn screening and all NIH funded uh, investigations. Zara, why don't you go ahead? Yes, thank you. Related to the same topic, data sharing, uh, I have a question and comment with regard to increasing diversity. Uh, is it correct to assume that future direction of newborn screening research also include expanding global partnership in this space? And if so, then I wonder if you could comment on, uh, again, the same question that uh, just um, Amy brought up with respect to uh, data sharing and how to facilitate such uh, basically uh, global partnerships. I think certainly we want to see newborn screening deployed across the globe. And to the extent that we can help facilitate that, I think we're very interested. You know, and I know that that could involve things like adapting existing technologies to a lower resource setting or maybe developing a new assay that could be deployed out in the field or something rather than in a specialized lab or hospital setting. Uh, so we would definitely love to encourage that research. As for the data sharing challenges, you know, the, the policy mandates that you think about data sharing, but it doesn't mandate that all data are shared. So obviously you have to respect any kind of local regulations, policies, and laws 
such as in the European Union, the um, GDPR has been really a barrier for a lot of um, international research collaborations. And so obviously whatever plan you propose has to comply with any applicable laws like that. But to the extent possible, obviously, we would love to have broader data sharing. And if there's a way to do that with some kind of federated data analysis or data system, um, you know, certainly encourage folks to incur um, look into some of those kind of innovative methods. And, and we do have some funding opportunity announcements that are really trying to um, encourage partnerships globally. And I'm thinking, you know, one example is the ClinGen uh, curation expert panels. Um, I guess it's a program announcement. And in particular, that is encouraging groups of experts in given uh, rare diseases or uh, groups of related rare diseases to put together a curation panel that reviews the literature and what's known about particular genomic variants and their association with disease. and help create the evidence base, what was discussed uh, with regard to ClinVar and ClinGen and the relationship to understanding what does a variant mean? What does that variant of uncertain significance mean? Has someone else seen it? And if so, how strong are the evidence, is the evidence that uh, connects that variant with a particular disease phenotype? So those types of activities we know are strengthened when people from around the world put their heads together because the variants that we see in the US may be different from the variants that are seen in other parts of the world. So that type of funding opportunity and others really require uh, partnerships um, internationally to help uh, create the evidence base. Melissa, this, this is Bob Boat at CDC in Atlanta. Am I reaching up there? We hear you. I don't know if we see you, but we hear you, Bob. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't want you to see me. So everything's <laughs> working just the way I want. Um, since you mentioned that, I've been thinking this for a while. The, I, I heard a, a, a talk given um, several years ago at a uh, uh, symposium that was convene, convened by the Jeffrey Modell Foundation and um, had a lot to do with people on screen. But there were these discussions on gene therapy, and I've always thought, had always thought of gene therapy as a, um, a rich person's option, a rich country's option. I wasn't thinking about gene therapy in the underserved, huge underserved populations in other parts of the world and so on. But the, the speaker, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the speaker's name, but had a, an entirely different take on it. And the example he used was, if you screen for lysosomal storage disorders in remote underserved populations, what good is that gonna do? Who's gonna deliver the enzyme replacement therapy? Who's gonna administer it and so on? But if you could do a corrective therapy, a gene therapy that was truly corrective the way we would like it to be, you, you could suddenly open up a whole world of therapies to people that would, to children um, who, who, who would not have other options. So that, that's just a different way of thinking about gene therapy that had never occurred to me. Perhaps many of you all have thought that way before, but, but the idea that we could, um, translate and, and diffuse some of our uh, the benefits of the research done in in our country and in similar places to um, underserved populations. Gene therapy could actually be part of that, I guess. So ju just a, um, a thought to convey from something that I was surprised to hear when I first heard it. You know, Bob, I had a similar um, kind of epiphany a number of years ago. I think I was at an American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics conference, and um, I heard of one of my former medical student colleagues uh, who was working uh, for a gene therapy company, but was very engaged in the sickle cell disease space. And, you know, there are certainly treatments available for individuals with sickle cell disease, but the prospect of gene therapy to correct um, the genetic uh, variant 
could have huge implications, particularly for those portions of sub-Saharan Africa that are really impacted by sickle cell disease. So, I mean, that to me was also kind of an enlightenment moment and a recognition that, you know, I, I think it behooves us to all think about ways in which we can make these therapies more equitably available to a larger portion of the population that would most benefit from them. Well, thank you, Melissa. That's wonderful because um, each year Emory uh, presents a, a uh, symposium on newborn screening uh, in memory of Paul Fernhoff, the outstanding pediatrician that we lost in, in 2011. And this year, the speaker is going to be Jim Ekman, who is now emeritus at Emory, but he's done as much for uh, sickle cell at the public health level as probably anyone in the country, maybe in the world. And he's going to be the speaker in this year's uh, Fernhoff lecture. So I'm going to bring that up. I mean, can we realistically imagine that in 10 years or so, maybe less, that it would be possible to deliver um, cassettes and 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 so on. It's it's a, a strange sort of vision, I think, but I, I wonder if it might work. Is that lecture going to be publicly available, Bob? <laughs> yeah. In fact, we all, well, you know, we were in the we got into the same thing as everyone else. I say were because I work with the folks at Emory. We we first put the thing together. Um, Harry and I discussed it with uh, the Emory folks, and it's it's been going on now. We we. Uh, they, Emory, it's, it's not a government thing at all. Emory has received uh, uh, some really nice uh, uh, support from the Legacy of Angels Foundation and, and other, other advocacy groups. Anyhow, um, yeah, uh, so everything's hybrid now, nowadays. And so I think, I mean, we're still wondering, are we going to be able to do it in person? Because at any point, you know, they might close down uh, a, a large gathering in an auditorium. Um, we're about two months away. It's September 7th, I believe, is the, the date for the lecture this year. And um, uh, yeah, I'll send you that information. And we're hoping that this will be the first hybrid lecture because the last two have been purely virtual. And we've been hoping that this time we can actually, um, you know, have the benefit of being present at the, at the lecture. But, I, I, it, but if it's purely virtual, fine. I'll get you that information. And we would love to have people, we, we've gotten a bigger audience since we've gone virtual. So that's. I think that's the one other silver lining I would comment on with regard to the pandemic is that it has allowed for many of our workshops and seminar series to be more broadly accessible by a larger group of people because we've had to do things virtually. We couldn't, we couldn't meet in person for many of these events, so. Yeah, so, so you make do with what you got. Exactly. This has been outstanding, by the way. This is the, the last two days have been just terrific. So congratulations to all the organizers, all the speakers. Um, I just uh, uh, always enjoyed this a lot. And I think this year was, was especially good. Um, we're really excited to hear that. I wanted to say that, you know, these meetings have been so great the last few years. We were actually able to get several of the presenters from previous meetings to write manuscripts and submit them as a special edition to the American Journal of Medical Genetics. So we hope that that special edition will be out this fall. And so we'll be asking the same thing of some of the speakers from today, although they don't know it. So don't leave the call yet, guys. Um, but we'll be talking to you about that in the future. But we really um, appreciate the, the engagement and the opportunity to showcase some of your efforts and get the word out. Amen. I see that we are coming to the top of the hour. So I just want to remind everybody, I can put it back into the chat that we would love to hear your ideas. Feel free to send Melissa and I any thoughts or comments that you have. Um, and we are also planning on putting out an RFI, hopefully later this summer or fall um, with these same questions. So that'll be another opportunity for you to be able to provide some input to us. Thank you all so much for your feedback and input. We really appreciate it. 